Welcome to the Intuitive Hour with psychic medium, author, and intuitive life coach, Michelle Beltran. The Intuitive Hour will empower you to learn how to magnify your intuitive voice. Listen in and expand your understanding of what it means to be psychic and how to awaken, amplify, and trust your inner voice. Welcome to the 2017 Hay House World Summit. We're grateful that you're joining us. I'm Krista Noel, Editor-in-Chief of Best Self Magazine, and I'm excited to sit down today to chat with Michelle Beltran to discuss her book, Take the Leap, What It Really Means to Be Psychic, Delving into Psychic Abilities and the Power of Our Own Intuitive Voices. Michelle is a psychic medium, an author, and an intuitive coach. She has become a leading international authority in the spirituality arena, specializing in psychic functioning, spiritual counseling, controlled remote viewing, and mediumship. She is the owner of Readings with Michelle and the host of the iTunes podcast, The Intuitive Hour, Awaken Your Inner Voice. She is also a former professional cyclist and lifelong fitness enthusiast who deeply believes that by balancing health and nutrition, one promotes vitality and psychic intuitiveness. And I have to interject and say She has one of the most diverse backgrounds I have ever encountered that has surely enriched her experience in this arena and in her work with her clients. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, Kristen. Thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. And we are pleased to have you. So now that we've sparked some of the inquisitive minds, I think we should just dive right into your background because I was just kind of um, amazed by your story. And um, I would love for you to tell us how someone with a a degree in political science who seeks a career as a law enforcement officer was in the United States Air Force and worked as a probation officer becomes a psychic. (laughs) I think that's a good place to start. (laughs) Excellent. Yes, I love that question. Yeah, you know, so I would say that um, in in many ways where I've come to does make sense, Uh, despite a career in law enforcement, um, uh, despite uh, uh, professional sport, I've had just a love and a passion and a desire for the metaphysical uh, since a very young age. Uh, You know, my first psychic reading was at nine, uh, which I received, by the way, did not give. Uh, I, I found that I used um, my sense and, and kind of uh, gut sense and intuition throughout my life to guide me. I am a second-generation psychic. Uh, you know, when I was young, um, my mother, uh, as a healer and energy worker and psychic herself, you know, made it really safe for us to to talk about the unknown, uh, spiritual books we had strewn about our home. You know, it was safe and okay to talk about uh, other realms and human possibility, and, uh, and and so so then you know in my mid twenties I just developed this voracious appetite for the metaphysical and the psychic realm and found myself reading and rereading uh, uh, some of Hay House's own uh, James Von Prague, John Holland, uh, Wayne Dyer, Deborah King, reading and learning and and uh, so looking back there's a platform there that was there. Uh, I, I will say it, it certainly found me, and I didn't expect it. It just sort of unraveled, and and so yes, yeah, so it's it wasn't the normal uh, trajectory th- that I had in, in, as a law enforcement officer, but I just love that, and I feel like that serves to convey the the perspective that you know being psychic, being intuitive, whatever we want to call it, it's normal, it's natural, and and it's it's innate, and. Uh, 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 so I, I like um, how you uh, use you that know, word, you know, that you actually brought yeah. normal into it because, yeah. you know, we sort of say, quote, unquote, you know, a normal trajectory. But I don't want you to gloss yeah. over. Let's go back for a second because, like, you just covered, yeah. like, you know, 20 years of your life. And, <laughs> and your, yeah. your childhood is so fascinating to me. So when, you know, we have these stereotypes, right, about what a psychic looks like. You know, they should have a crystal ball and they should be more woo-woo and uh, more of a free spirit. And you were this, 
you describe being this, um, you know, sounded like you were like a feisty kid because, you know, you know, I love when you had shared the story about, you know, growing up in a house where your mom was a psychic. So this was all present around you. So you had, like you said, access to medical metaphysical books. This was, you, you know, your, you know, your mom was open to having these conversations of, of possibility. And, and yet I loved when you described that you were this little kid who said, yeah, that's all great, but I want proof. I want to see the proof. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, absolutely. so let's go back to, to that, you know, like what, what was, what was it like, you know, you're growing up, what was, you know, what did it mean, you know, to you as a child? Um, did you understand what it meant to be psychic? Right. Good question. I love that. I, I didn't, as a matter of fact, I, I didn't know what it meant there. At that age, I was, um, I, I found that I was very intrigued and curious for sure. Uh, but I didn't know what, what being a psychic meant. I knew that I had a sense growing up and, and even young and, and throughout my teens even, uh, that, um, uh, I could, I could understand people. I, uh, um, and many of our listeners may, may, uh, relate to this. I could, I could go into a room and just kind of sense the energy that was there, um, and feel, uh, what felt good or maybe not so good about a situation, an event, an experience, people. I found that people were coming to me often and, uh, I, I like wanting coaching and advice and I noticed those things. I would describe it as it was in, it was more of an intuition or a gut sense or a real knowing of people. Um, maybe I felt like at times I was a little a step ahead of, like I could see what was coming. I had no idea it was what we, what we would, what I would call now is psychic ability. Uh, it was sort of like the precursor to it and the foundation. And, um, and, I, and I used it more in a gut sense in my work in law enforcement. It was what caused me to maybe go double check that, that door or that facility. And then uh, for mm. what reason, I didn't know why, but had this pull to do it. And well, hey, there was the burglary in progress or something going on. So, and we all have to. Exactly. I was right? just, this, just this, thinking this, that, like, yeah. like, I mean, that's, yeah. You know, you leave the house and you drive down the road and you think, oh, my God, did I leave that candle burning? You know, yeah, I got to go right. back. And so we get those hits. But so as a child, though, did you did you feel that there was something um, that you had some kind of a different sense or a different gift? Did, was there anything that isolated you from maybe the quote unquote normal experience of childhood? Uh, not one thing, just in a sense that. Uh, uh, of, you know, all these things I've just explained. I just, I felt so normal. Uh, I had a curiosity, right. you know, and, you know, and I'm glad you've asked this because it reminds me of what I see so often in my work. And that is that it, there's a very, very strong, uh, pattern in, in clients that I work with. And more often than not, what was right in our life or even maybe what was not so right in our life, uh, uh, was going on around seven, eight, or nine. So usually, my point there is that around six, seven, eight, nine years old, we're, we are often doing those things that we love. And in much of the work that I do now, that's where I take clients back to that time because we were doing what made us happy, what our calling was then. And, and even if we have some kind of blocks or stuck energy, it was usually around there too that sort of got embedded. So it's a pretty critical time, and, and it, I, I'm no exception. At nine years old, eight years old, I was curious, right? I was doing what I loved, and, and I had, uh, which is so often the case later in life. Boom, here it came, and it blossomed, and I'm just following that calling. Uh, so that's one of the things I actually do work on with my clients is going back to that time. What was it you were doing then mm -hmm. that you loved? Take it off the shelf, dust it off, and do it now. It's like remind right? yourself, right? Uh, remind yourself of who you yeah. were. Was your yeah. mom a practicing um, psychic? Uh, she was not practicing at that time. She went through her own formal education later, but she was very in tune with that right brain activity. Uh, she's an artist. 
uh, she worked through an art therapy as a means to assist others and coach and, and, and you know, do, uh, travel down that therapeutic road. Uh, but uh, for herself as well, a little bit later in life came her more formal education. But again, it was in there. And for her, it was manifesting in this artistic way, again, which many, many of us do have. If, you know, this, this notion of what is a psychic, well, I, I actually tend to, the, the word psychic, yeah, I'm not sure it's always correct. It, psychic is really just intuition, it's ESP, it's altered states of consciousness, it's moments of breakthroughs, uh, it's pockets of genius, it's where the artist is, you know, in that, in that deep work. Uh, uh, and, it, you know, many artists, my mom included, would uh, talk about how when they're in that space of artistic right brain work, you know, that's where we're having, we're feeling connected to a whole or a source right. or there's a timeless, spaceless sense. That's what it is, right? Um, that's where it starts. It's often that thing that gets bypassed, right? We, we call it, yeah. we call it other things. We'll say, um, you know, oh, it's a coincidence, you know, or, right. or oh, there are no coincidences. Right. They are synchronicity. Exactly. <laughs> so that's also like, you know, uh, being around children you realize um, how connected to that they are and to that power. And so I think it's also really important to just remind our children to stay connected to that, you know, so that they don't have to go back years and decades later searching for it again, you know. So tell us about what was it that at nine years old you said, okay, that's it. I want the proof. I want to see a psychic. And what, what, how was that experience for you? Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was more just a real curious time of exploration and, uh, yes, wanting to see the proof, uh, wanting to, um, uh, wanting to, to have answers. Um, the most important thing, uh, we've touched a little bit on that about that experience was that, you know, at that age, here I was uh, uh, nurturing something that was deep inside me that was kind of a, had this calling energy and, and pursuing it. And uh, it wasn't so much about what came through in that session as much as that, you know, at that age, here this was manifesting and it was becoming a reality. I was curious, asking questions. Um, uh, but that's a pretty amazing so, thing for a nine-year-old to be clear enough about to ask for, uh, right? So yeah. even if you didn't <laughs> really understand it at the time, I don't think many nine-year-olds ask to have a psychic um, reading. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely correct. And uh, honestly, I'm not sure what moved me to that. It, I, I just don't have an answer. I just, I think mostly what happened is that I trusted that inner sense of desire and curiosity, my mother made it safe, right. and so it, I could do it. One of the things that actually comes to mind uh, is a, another uh, session later, more, more later in my teens that I had that really impacted me, and uh, I went to a psychic, and she asked me to make three wishes or intentions, something along those lines, and she said, say them in your mind, and so I did, and uh, one of the things that uh, has always been so important to me at, from a young age is to have peace of mind, to rest my head and just have peace of mind within me. Uh, and, and so I made these wishes and she told me back my wishes and she told me peace of mind. And from that moment, I said, my goodness, she could not possibly know this. She could not possibly know this. So that was a pretty pivotal moment. Right. So, uh, you know, I knew there was something here. <laughs> so going back to the feisty nine-year-old, you know, and who was sort of demanding uh -huh. um, proof. I want proof. So did you, yeah. did you, do you feel like the seeds were planted then? Or was it this, this later um, reading that really gave you the proof? Uh, I did, it wasn't even this later reading that gave me the proof. I'll tell you what gave me the proof. And that was when I actually started experiencing it myself. Um, and so, and so I'll back up a little bit. Um, very like, uh, many people who come into this work, there's often a bottoming out. There's a time where there's a loss of some kind, be it a loved one, a home, a job, health. I am no exception. And I happen to have, I just got hit with this big stick, and, and it all came tumbling down all at once. Uh, job, uh, f uh, finance, home, relationship, boom, here it was. And 
you know, of course, the, the bottoming out is, is difficult, but it is always correlated to the extent of the forward momentum. And so I just, I just went in. I had no place to go but in, and, and I started developing spiritually, internally, and that sort of launched me forward. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was through this kind of bottoming out that I began uh, learning more and then wanting the proof. And, and oh, of course, you know, for me, it took off quickly. Images, impressions, clairvoyancy, boom, here it was. I couldn't believe it. My jaw was dropping, and I had a very strong essence and feeling that there is something very much bigger than me happening here. And I have very clear memories of having a conversation with God at that time saying, whatever this is, I don't understand it, but it's beautiful. It's bigger than me. I can't. Un- it's happening. I want it rooted in rightness, or don't bring it to me. And and so it was it was awareness that of how magnanimous this was. Right. And uh, yeah. And so so well, when let, let's sure. let's let's also talk about the the bottoming out for a second because I always yeah. call that a wake okay. up call. You know, <laughs> you can yeah. you know you you got your wake up call. Um, yes, I did. So it's quite a, kind of like when we aimlessly continue on doing the same things, bypassing our emotions or whatever it is, repeating patterns. Um, so you had this this experience that kind of knocked you for a loop, right? There was no more you had no ability to ignore this any longer, right? Can you right. can you Correct. can you share a little bit of that so, you know, perhaps maybe somebody listening can relate to it. Yeah. Um yeah, you know, it was this it was this internal sense of how can I put it towards Okay. I began, it caused me to go in, and I started to ask the questions, why am I here? What am I meant to do? What is my calling? And, you know, the typical nine-to-five job and having this and that, that car, that this, you know, didn't matter anymore. It was about me internally, my soul speaking, why am I here? I wanted to, I wanted to, I felt like I wanted to contribute, I wanted to give back, I wanted to grow spiritually. By the way, all of these things, there's a few things that are very, very uh, similar in, in all of us that I've learned along the way, and uh, and it seems like we all kind of do reach this point, no matter how we got there, of wanting to contribute, wanting wanting to know more, wanting to have a significance in our life. And so all of those things, this caused me to want, and, and so uh, uh, I knew Despite the despair, despite the, the difficult, difficulty of the time, I knew there was more, and I knew and I trusted that what was happening here was going to be the doorway. Like this was the vehicle to that self-actualization, and and that is so one of the things my teacher taught. One of my teachers taught me early on. I used to think this was about being psychic when I first started. I thought, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> well, it is, and you know, my jaw does still drop, but it's not about that. It's about self-actualization and a vehicle to your forward momentum and sort of letting your soul speak, following your calling, you know, being true to you, finding that true power. Right. So, but again, you, you had these seeds planted very, very young. Well, obviously probably just born, um, being aware of this. Do you feel like at any point you sort of, um, you were pushing back against it or you were rebelling against it because, you know, going into sort of being brought up in a house where this was an accepted conversation and then saying, no, you know, I think I'm going to just, um, I'm going to table this right now and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to work in law enforcement. And I'm sure it just really enriched the ultimate experience and your abilities. But talk about how that, how, how that juxtaposition worked and how you melded, you know, those psychic abilities with the vocation that you were in. Right. So, yes. And so, so early on, it wasn't necessarily uh, what I would call psychic ability. It was more intuition, gut sense, uh, you know, what we all have. Um, and, and I was, I was paying attention to my emotions. My, I, I learned very early on that my emotions were just, oh, the best compass system I had and they would guide me. And so if uh, there was a sense of, well, I don't know about this situation or this person, then I trusted that. Or if there was a sense of excitement about what was happening, okay, yes, this feels good, I'm going to do it. And so I just tuned into that. Um, there, those are what uh, tendencies that typically a, an empath would have, that we see that in, in empathic and people who are very in tune to emotion. And, and 
that's how it first uh, it first unraveled for me. Um, it wasn't until the formal psychic education and after my sort of bottoming out that I really began to see what it is and uh, and how and uh, learn about psychic functioning and, and you know really essentially what was there all along. I just didn't know it. Right, and I I also. Um don't want you to gloss over that because you, you seem to me like the kind of person that's like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do it all the way. And you did, <laughs> you did go and have quite a bit of formal training. So was that, was that during, um, during your time in law enforcement or was it afterwards? And like, where's, where was the, you know, just take us through that. Yes. It, it was in the time of, of, um, law enforcement. Um, it was actually when I was a probation officer. And um, it was inspired, interestingly, by a supervisor of, of mine, wonderful supervisor, and uh, she had lost a family member. And um, um, so I began reading at that time about loss of loved ones and mediumship. Um, George Anderson, the father of mediumship, has several wonderful books out there. And so I uh, got a hold of those book and books and read them and reread them, and I was just fascinated, fascinated, all the while still curious and wanting the proof, right, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, which ultimately I did get. There is science behind this, and it is out there. Um, but uh, so, it, so that sort of sparked this time, I'd say maybe my late 20s or so, early 30s, and at that time when I just read and read and read. Uh, all all aspects of metaphysical, about meditation, about, uh, you know, Akashic records, about energy work, about uh, mediumship, all kinds of things. I just, just became kind of a sponge for this. So that was my own learning. Did you start to mm-hmm. um, receive any messages or about your friend's um, loss? Um, that did not happen then. It, it did not. But that, was a, that sparked you. It, st- it inspired it, okay. correct. Okay. The actual, uh, for me, and this may not, be, of course, this is certainly not someone else's experience. Everyone is so unique in their development, I find, and I just love that. Uh, but I, for me, it was when I started formal education and got in the care of uh, teach for teachers and experts where I felt safe, who I felt had, knew what they were doing. I had done research about all of this, and so... Uh, that's when it really started taking off for me. When I said, you know, again, uh, coupled with that bottoming out, where I, I really would say I was open. I was at such a place, and, and that's the thing about a bottoming out. There's no walls up anymore. Uh, inhibitions are, have dissolved, and we're open. We tend to be willing to, to absorb instead of having these left brain uh, notions of what right or wrong is or should or shouldn't be. I was just open right. and I wanted to grow. So that platform allowed, I believe, once the education began coming in, a safe space for it to just flourish. And that's when it really started coming in for me. What, tell us what uh, training looks like. What, what kind of training did you have and for how long and with who? You know, tell us what, what does psychic training entail? Sure. So uh, it began for me in uh, psychic development, uh, psychic as opposed to mediumship, psychic meaning uh, connecting with our senses, receiving mental images and impressions through our senses, mediumship meaning connecting with spirit on the other side. So I started in psychic development at a school modeled after Berkeley Psychic Institute in, in, in Berkeley, California, and um, went through this training program, and then uh, on the heels of that, uh, or actually during that, I had my first experience with mediumship, even though I didn't know it at the time, and uh, so on the heels of that, I went into a a three-month mediumship program, Um, and once successfully completing that, I... Uh, you know, one thing just leads to another. As you, you know, once the door opens, the teacher presents sure. as you're ready, as they say. And it certainly did for me. And so that then led into uh, remote viewing, controlled remote viewing, and went through all the advanced levels there. Um, Dr. Paul H. Smith is my teacher in remote viewing, and uh, he was actually one of the uh, assigned to the military Stargate program, which is the military's psychic spy program. You know, the military actually had a psychic spy program in response to uh, Russia's program at that time in the 70s and 80s. So this is very like music budget. to your ears. You know, you've this is oh, this is why. Yes. See, this is why when you said. 
um, in spite or despite, I was like, no, actually, you know, now that I hear this, it's like, it's so rich. It's so rich to have these experiences in these different worlds because we're in this world together, you know, all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, it's the, it's the thing I love most about your bio, you know, is that you had, you really walking in these two different worlds. Well, you know, and interesting, I'm not sure they are two different worlds, Kristen. Right. And, well, it's and how we, we perceive that, them, right? Correct. Yes, yes, and that and that's what you meant. It's it's we tend to look at this as it, as this innate wonderful ability that we're all born with as separate from us. Like it's something to achieve beyond us and it's just within us. We just have to say okay to it, right? And let it blossom. That that's it. That simple. Well, and also, I mean, unfortunately again, speaking in stereotypes, you think of probation officers and law enforcement and, um, you know, maybe prison guards as being so hardened. And it's really nice to actually think of someone like you working in that environment, connecting on a whole other level. And that's, that's really a beautiful thing. So, so you did your training cause you're just that kind of gal. You're going to like get your proof <laughs> and do your work and get in there and, um, have your degrees. When did you finally reach, reach the juncture where you said, okay, you know what? I'm going to practice and I'm going to take on clients. Right. Yeah. So that actually came through one of my teachers after graduation. Uh, we, I very clear memories of that uh, conversation. And I, I said to, to her, well, what's next? <laughs> and she said to me, essentially, well, you hang your shingle. She kicked you, you right out, out the door. You do <laughs> she did. And, you know, thank goodness, because I did not, I did not have that in mind. I didn't, hadn't thought about that. I was just intrigued by this wonderful ability. And uh, here now, uh, it's presenting as something that I could, could, you know, have a, be a life calling and uh, create a business with uh, in much the same way she was. And so I said, okay, I'm, I, I trust this. It, it, it is, it, it, despite the unknowns or uh, maybe even some of the, the doubts, and I just, I knew that it was so much bigger than me, and I just trusted that knowing. And as humans, you know, we know truth. We know when something's right, and I felt that rightness and that truth in this. Well, and also, so, so I did. And also a great teacher, you know, like a, like a yeah. leader, a great leader yeah. creates leaders. So, yes, you know, yeah. so it's wonderful that your teacher finally said, okay, you're done out, get, get out there and right. get out there and do your stuff. Right. And what was that like? Absolutely. What was it like when you finally, you know, how did you get your first client? Yeah, let me think. Okay. You know, uh, I, you know, um, I believe that this came through and working with my teachers, uh, that opened up some doors and funnels for clients. I believe it was um, uh, uh, maybe a contact to her. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I just can't remember real clearly, but I believe it was some a some avenue through her. I also then, you know, I just said okay, and I, I you know, what what we typically do if we're going to start a venture or a business in this day and age is we get a website going and we create a business card and we give our uh, business a name and we begin sort of creating the bios and all the the nuts and bolts mm -hmm. to create a business and and so I did that, put it out there, right. <laughs> uh, started linking with the social medias of the day of the age and and it just took off and I just am, am, am in gratitude every single day. Yeah, if you build every it day. they will come right? Yes they will. Well but again just yeah. going back to it's a testament to having great teachers because it's also about creating um, co-creating and knowing that there's room for all of us and that they can you know support you and send people your way because you were ready. Yes. So let's, yeah, so then I, let's, let's talk about this wonderful book. We have to talk about okay. this book. So uh -huh. when did you, okay. when did you have the inspiration and when did you know it was time to write a book and, and, and when did you know that there was a book to birth? <laughs> Good. I knew when I started getting requests for it, students and clients, uh, wanted something that they could learn from, uh, a development book, um, that started happening. And then I began to see, uh, I just know the value in it. I saw that from the get go, uh, there's th that this is an avenue, a platform towards self actualization. Uh, it changed my life 
why not yours? You know, you know when you do something and you love it so much, like I, I, on the side, I, I dance and, and, and so often I'm in that dance space and I think to myself, everyone should do this. This is so awesome. Well, it was the same thing with psychic work. Everyone should do this. There's value in this. It changed my life. I want it to change yours. And so I wanted to get the message out. Um, I wanted people to know it's within us. It's not separate like we think. And, and the biggest thing was kind of going back to that tenet that, that it's normal. Normal people do this. Not, not, uh, it's not a five feet off the ground unattainable thing. Right. When we say normal, and, we'll use our air quotes, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and the other thing I'm thinking while you're saying that is that connecting to our psychic ability and understanding it does not mean that we have to practice. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't mean we have to hang a shingle and make this our vocation, right? So it's, it's really about a deeper understanding of ourselves and our abilities and, and our true power and essence, correct? Absolutely. And more often than not, the student that comes in to learn is pursuing it for that very reason, because they have that understanding. They know they have some, usually they have some level of understanding that it's going to assist them in that way and can. Yeah, you know, when, when you're in your true power, you're able to help others right. be in their true power. You said a few moments ago, I just I will echo that. They have a sense about that right. for this. Well, think about it. It's probably, it's got to be the, the ultimate navigational tool through life, no matter what career you're yeah. working in. I mean, to be able to to use that tool in your relationships and, and your connection with people brings great value. Yes. Well said. Yes. So describe how someone would use your book and what your, what your, your real goal with this book is. Okay. Yes. Good. So, um, okay. Let me just first say this. Um, I started to take the leap with the discussion about intuition uh, and that was done for a very specific reason. Uh, I really wanted to show readers that, that they actually already have this natural and normal propensity or platform called their intuition. And, and if they could just simply acknowledge, yes, that they've had one of those unique gut feelings or senses about something, a person, an event, or a decision, something that they, they couldn't explain, <laughs> right, but which turned out to be right, when they followed that gut sense, then their, their own personal experience would be their link, their connection, their evidence uh, to kind of absorb this in. And what a great place to begin from, right? So, so uh, that, was kind, that was a pretty pivotal point for, for the, the development of the book. Um, and because of that, one, actually one of my favorite quotes, can I share that with yeah, you? Yeah, I was just going to ask quotes? you. I was going to say, do you, do you <laughs> have the book with you? <laughs> I have it here. Uh, yeah. You know what? I, and, I'd love uh, to, I'd love to ask you to do, um, two things. One, okay. one, <laughs> I know that, um, you're going to share, you know, some of your favorite quotes or passages from, from the book. Um, and then two, I would love for you to just kind of randomly open the book and see where we land and, and, you know, like what's the message we need to, to receive here in this conversation, um, you and I and our listeners. So you can, you can pick whatever order you want to do that in. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well, let's talk about, uh, the, this, the quote, if we could, uh, the, about intuition. Um, and so, What's become one of my favorite quotes based upon this sense of, of um, having everyone having their own link to this ability. Uh, de de we can call it deja vu. Uh, you know, we, it's access through our dreams, um, gut sense. So, uh, but one of my ma favorite quotes is this. Given that intuition lives in the realm of the unexplained, you may be able to conclude that you already have the foundation for acquiring psychic abilities. Mm. So, you know, so naturally that gives, my intention and my hope was that that would give the reader permission to 
<clears throat> move forward based upon their own personal experience. They didn't need me. They don't need my book. They need their own internal sense and knowing that they actually have had this. They just have to claim it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I know you had another quote, and I, um, I know we kind of moved past this very quickly, but it's very important to you, the body-mind connection and honoring honoring our vessels, right? And and so I know you, I think you have a quote for that. Is, do you? Yes. Uh, so one of the things, my life theme has been one of health and wellness that's been so ever important to me. And what I've recognized is that <clears throat> the value of, of taking care of my body in the temple that it is. And uh, I, I work that in a fair amount with clients in, in my own life, in my teachings, um, you know, giving attention to this this temple, this this body that we have. We only have one, right? And so, <clears throat> this idea that our higher power, that that soul side of us, wants to be housed in a in a healthy vessel. So, so one of my favorite quotes that I'm looking at here in my book is: it, "It's very difficult for a higher power to be housed in an unhealthy vessel." Right? We, we higher power wants a healthy vessel, and, and so. I always, when I talk about this, I always want to make it clear this doesn't go mean that anyone goes and loses 20 pounds or gains 20 pounds or whatever they, you know. <clears throat> it means just that you love your body now. You love who you are now and you be happy with that. Right. You nourish it. You rest. You hydrate. Uh, nutrition. But there's also nourishment that comes from emotional self and healing and, and meditation. And uh, so... That's kind of my thought space behind that quote and, and taking care of the body and how it relates to this work. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a wonderful point. And obviously, you have been a professional cyclist, so I think you've been taking care of your vessel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've tried, and it certainly has helped. But, you know, again, caring for your vessel, that was my journey. And so it just is simply just loving your body and uh, you know, giving it what it desires and, uh, you know, living what healthy feels like to you. <clears throat> so do you want to just pick something randomly? It doesn't have to be, even if you don't land on a quote, maybe it would just pop into a certain section and you could describe maybe that chapter or, or uh, see what comes up. Yeah, well, actually, I did that. And what I'm coming to here, interestingly enough, <laughs> is the the, uh, the section here in the writing about um, opening your clairvoyance, uh, connecting with your visual reception, what that is, and how to do that. Um, and so I guess in, an, in a nutshell, what, what I would talk about here is just, you know, that third eye and that intention of seeing, uh, you know, how to go about opening that third eye. Uh, I first start with a, a talk about your intention, right? Focused intention. Uh, uh, we know uh, that w a pr when we say yes, I'm going to do this, and we set that intention. That's the first. That's the first uh, order of business, if you will. And so, um, uh, in this chapter, I talk about uh, setting that intention. Uh, I talk a little bit here also about meditation. Uh, you know, Kristen, if I had a magic wand, I would wave it. And if I had a magic wand and I could wave it and make everyone do what I wanted, I'd have them meditate. <laughs> That's not in the book, right. but that's what I'm saying to you now as I as I look at this chapter on meditation and the value of it. And I just have to tell Wait, you there's... that this, um, you going into this um, chapter, this was my next question, and like literally, oh my goodness, literally have my <laughs> finger on it. So you just you just let it roll because it was my next question. Okay. Yeah. You don't need me here. I love this. Oh my goodness, <laughs> love this. Yeah, good. So yeah, so you know, there's so much goodness out there about meditation and how to do it and what it is, but truly. It, it's going to be, I'll say it's going to be the simplest and the hardest thing you'll, you'll ever do uh, because there is a natural and tendency in meditation for us to think. We're humans. We want to think. And so we have thought that wants to come in. And, and so that kind of c can sometimes create a little bit of an obstacle. But it is so very powerful. It is what separates the good. Uh, I don't, uh, let's see. It's what separates the very profound and uh, uh, um, ex um, uh, veteran uh, psychics and remote viewers and intuitives from uh, perhaps those who maybe are more of a beginner or not doing not quite as well maybe perhaps as they're desiring. It's that meditation. And the reason is because in meditation, we learn to quiet our mind. We learn to close that left brain. 
Um, and when we do that, we uh, the the uh, the left brain is so powerful. It wants to try and come in and create what we think's right. It, there's uh, these tendencies of trying to get n- nail the target or nail what's coming in or get you know. Just, and that's all ego. So meditation h- helps us to move away from that. Uh, so very, very valuable. You know, even if a person was not practicing psychic development, I would say meditate. There's so much research that shows that the benefits of it emotionally, physically, mentally are, are dynamic, right? I, it, there's even research that, that says, shows us that the brain actually will grow and change after 11 hours of, of meditation. Studies out there showing that. So, so very, so very valuable. But uh, again, there's not any right way about meditation. I, I would say to listeners that meditation really, in its strictest sense, yes, it's kind of, it's, we think about it, meditation as being on the pillow, quiet, palms up, feet on the ground. But, you know, that runner that's out getting mm-hmm. that runner's high, or that artist that's drawing that canvas, uh, you know, my mother and her clay work, that is also nurturing this, this side of us. So that, in essence, is somewhat like meditation as well. So the message here, that right brain, musical, artistic, dance, bring it in, do it. Right. For sure, that matters. That leads me into my next um, question, which is, are, how are we getting in our own way? And how are we blocking um, blocking the third eye and, and our clairvoyance? Right. Uh, wonderful. I love that question. Okay. A couple things. Um, um, there is a very innate, strong tendency within human nature to have a fear of failure. As a psychic, intuitive, remote viewer, uh, someone in mediumship, whatever modality you choose in the metaphysical psychic realm, you must be able to tolerate failure and not be obsessed with success. It, it can happen. And so, you know, if this is not an end all be all, it is not, uh, it is not going to give us all answers. In fact, we don't want to have all an, uh, answers. And I teach my clients and students that the unknowns are safe, right? If we had all the knowns, we would actually go crazy. So we think we want them, but we don't, right? <laughs> right? Uh, well, therein comes dreams, right? Dreams is a way to process things in life and such. But so it's okay to not have those knowns. I think people tend to get fear comes when we aren't educated, when we have the fear of failure. And, and you know, it's, it's okay to not have all the answers. Psychic functioning, psychic uh, seeing is, uh, think of it like bits of information, support, guidance, assistance, okay? That's the first thing I would say about that blockage uh, question. The second thing would be about um, uh, that, again, going back to that left brain. Uh, in the remote viewing realm, we call this mental noise. Um, that's where uh, our, our left brain wants to leap forward into uh, what we expect should be, mm-hmm. right? So if, I, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe something to you that I'm holding in my hand. Are you ready? Sure. I've got an object in my hand. It's red, round, and it's edible. Okay? So what most people do when they hear that is instantly they do two things. They want to leap to, oh, what is that? Did you, and you, maybe someone's feeling that. You, yeah, and, then you, want, and then, you, then you leap to, I want to get it right. <laughs> exactly. I want to nail that. I want to get it I right. I want to get the right That's answer. Exactly. Yeah. And that, and that's ego. That's pure ego. And there's no place for that here. So that mental noise, that's one aspect we want to just, the, again, here comes that value of meditation that helps us to quiet that. And the second thing that usually happens there when I teach this in class is that uh, a, a person will typically leap to, oh, it's an apple, uh, right? Uh, red, round, uh, edible. Uh, and so, um, uh, so that showing, that's a absolutely wonderful display of the power of your left brain, that tricky little left brain that wants you, wants to come in and, and get what it was. And it leaps to an apple as a conclusion when actually uh, this could have been a red hard boiled Easter egg, a radish, a berry, you know, it could have been a number of things, but we tend to associate, we tend to leap to what is so closely related to us or our recent experience. So the person that had an apple this morning or last night 
you know, that's going to come in more powerfully. So those definitely, you know, blockages, but not in the sense that we don't uh, overcome them. Uh, we have tools in development to alleviate them, and that comes with uh, consistency, practice, right? Psychic development is very much like a muscle. We have to practice, practice, practice like anything, right? Mozart just didn't come out of the chute uh, wonderful <laughs> and, and, and his ability or many other uh, thought leaders or uh, people who are experts at what they do, they practice. So, in a, But in any event, these are some of the things that can limit us that certainly we, we can work through as we develop. Yeah. And I want to ask you about something that you had mentioned to me earlier, um, a sensory field trip. Can you tell us yes. what that is? Can you describe that that little field trip? Yes, and that was actually also a part of the chapter that we we flipped to uh, um, uh, flipped to a few moments ago, and uh, in um, kind of expanding on that more, in addition to the meditation uh, and spirit development circles as you develop your ability, this century field trip it's huge, it's pretty dynamic, and so essentially what it is is. Um, uh, getting a deeper sense of your own inner senses, your heightened senses, uh, um, your what we call clear abilities. We have clairvoyance, which means clear seeing, clear audience, which is clear hearing, uh, clear uh, 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 gustance, clear olfactory, all these different sensibilities on a heightened sense. Our daily sense is taken higher, right? So uh, what, what I encourage my students to do is to go to a sensory-rich place, a zoo, um, uh, uh, a gro- local grocery store or farmer's market where there's a lot of sensory data happening, take 30 or 40 minutes and experience it in a new way. Right, right? We tend to go, we tend to have these uh, blinders on and go in and get what we need and leave, but we never pay attention to what we're really smelling and what we're really seeing and what we're hearing and what direction it's coming from, looking high, looking low, feeling the temperature of what's around us, what's under our feet, uh, noticing textures, all of these kind of sensory uh, data kinds of inputs and influx, we 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 want to go and pay attention to, um, like let go of that tunnel vision for a little bit, <laughs> right? And really notice these things. What you do in this in this space is you're just essentially saying hello to your your senses. You're you're inviting them to come in. You're opening the door to it, to them. Um, One of the things that I really noticed for my own self as I started in my work with this, and which I actually do also see in students, is that often we have directional messages. It was from one of these experiences that I actually began to discover that uh, something coming in, ultimately what I realized was that something coming in from the far left meant past. Something in my pre- uh, in front of me meant present, and something from the uh, to the right was future, and so that became a way for me to receive directionally. Can I so, can I just uh, interrupt you a second and ask you? Yeah, could please. you just like for example, what kind of a thing would come in to the left? Like what what kind of yeah sense? Uh huh. Good. Uh, uh, for me, in a session, it would be because I am strongly uh, clairvoyant, which means I clear I images. By the way, we often tend to have one or two of these abilities that are strongest, not just one. For me, it's clear vision. I'm very in tune to that ability um, and a he- clear hearing. So uh, in my case, it would be a vision coming in for, from, the, from the left, for example. Uh, for someone else who maybe has a different ability going on, they might hear something in that way, in that left ear. Okay, so I'll give you an example. I had a, um, a client uh, recently, we were working through uh, 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 her life calling and her future and doing some uh, past work in her childhood. And from the past, an image came in of seeing her teaching a classroom. And I asked her about that, and she said, my goodness, you know, this is just incredible. She she had always wanted to teach, but it never and, – and that, that, by the way, we, ta- we spoke about this earlier. Wow. That manifested for her when she was nine years right. old, nine, ten years old in that time frame. And she said, my goodness, I have had uh, – she had this dream or vision, something of the sort about that, that she never forgot. But she didn't let it come because here again, those blocks, those silly blocks, right? Uh, and she was – she had a little bit of an uncertainty around children. 
And so we're, we're working through that. But she, it, now in her life, it's coming forward, and she's using that. So that picture for me came from that time past of her. So it would be something like that. Does that, does that answer that question? Yeah, no, it does a lot, especially when you're talking Good. about meditation, because, again, it's um, – for me, it's it's often just about creating that quiet space, and that's when yeah. a lot of visions come in. And, and those are the kinds of visions or inspiration that you can easily um, dismiss. But yes. I I really try to pay attention to that, and I love this notion of going into a market because I have to tell you, when I go grocery shopping, it's like boom, 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 and I'm not I'm just exactly. one, I'm, I'm going down the same aisles in the same direction, <laughs> picking up the same you know. Um, and so that's a really, it, it's really re- a great reminder for us to, you know, to slow down and like really experience what's happening around us. A- absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll add one interesting little caveat on a personal level or a uh, kind of story here. Uh, it, it, what I've noticed in doing all this work, when I come to a, a movie or watching a television, I don't watch it often, but when I do, I notice that you know, we might be looking at the character who's the mainstream on the on the on the on the movie screen, but I notice the street name in the background, or I notice the color of the dress of the person across the street in the back's wearing. So what's happened is my as kind of expanding on your point here that you're you're opening up to more. You're open. You're receptive. You're connected. Uh, you're seeing beyond that tunnel vision. It's like you're and seeing layers, natural, right? Right. Yeah. So I honestly could talk to you about this all day, but I know I don't want to um, crunch our time because I know you have this special gift for our listeners today, and you're going to guide us in a modified uh, version of your clairvoyant meditation to open the third eye, and they're also going to get this wonderful downloadable PDF if they would like to access. So I'm just going to turn this over to you right now to to begin and to guide us. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. Very good. So uh, this is a meditation uh, designed to assist you in opening your clairvoyance ability. I would ask that everyone uh, put their feet flat on the ground, sit comfortably with their palms up as we begin. All right. There is a dimension within you that is beyond this reality. It is that space void of minutes and days and has no semblance of time. Here, it matters not how old you are, what you look like, where you live, or who you know. Your life situation now has no relevance in this dimension of inner knowing and stillness. It is this place we go to in meditation today. Release the need to know yourself through concepts and thoughts. We are going to a place where there is not knowing and where it is safe to release all thought, concern, and daily ongoings. You will be able to come back to all of that after this meditation. In a comfortable seated position with your feet flat on the ground, begin to give attention to your breath Say hello to your breath. Relax. Close your eyes and breathe in. Feel the gentle and gradual rise and fall of your chest. Feel the expansion and compression of your lungs. Your posture embodies dignity, so be mindful of how you are sitting. An upright posture is better. Become aware of and notice your entire body. 
If there are areas of stiffness or pain, release them. Now, put your attention on your forehead above and between your eyes. This is where your third eye is located. This is the root of your clairvoyance. Here, you begin to strengthen, unravel, and become in tune with your clairvoyant ability. Let your attention be present in this space for a few moments. Next, envision a large, very large eye in this area. What does this eye look like to you? Are the lashes long or short? Is this eye almond shaped or round? Is there color? Visualize this third eye as larger than life. Imagine it wide open and alive. Envision it pulsing, rich with life. Breathe and be present with this image of your third eye as it reveals itself to you fully. As you begin to become more aware of and in tune to your third eye, it awakens. Trust, intend, and expect this ability is strengthening. Once you set this intention, the universe has heard you. Your only task is to let the ability blossom. Even after this meditation is over, your third eye and your psychic ability is still flourishing. We're now going to create your reading screen. A reading screen is a receptacle of sorts, much like a movie screen captures a movie. Your third eye and your reading screen work together and are as one. This receptacle will be a tool where you will see images and pictures of higher essence as you grow in your spiritual knowing. Images will present on your reading screen much the same way that you just imagined your larger than life third eye. Next, imagine this reading screen out in front of you. Make it be whatever you desire. You might imagine a movie screen, a computer screen, or a giant chalkboard. Whatever feels right to you, create this. Once it is created, look closely at the details of it. What color is it? How big is it? What is it made of? Let's begin using your third eye and reading screen together. Picture an image releasing from your third eye. Let it go to this viewing receptacle. See the image present clearly and as detailed as possible. It doesn't matter what image comes to your awareness. Just let it come and be aware of it. What is this image you see? Is it big? Is it small? Is there color? If you could touch it, how would it feel? Are you unsure? Then reach out and touch it. Does it move? Do you smell anything? What sounds do you hear? Chirps, bells, 
the wind. Gently become aware of all these details. We are now going to open your third eye fully so that you can begin to access and open the door to your own intuition and psychic knowing. Place any finger from your hand between your eyes and above the bridge of your nose. Then push up slightly toward the center of your forehead. Rotate your finger to the left a few times in a circular motion, then to the right a few times in a circular motion. Take a deep breath. Inhale and exhale. This simple but profound action sends the message to your third eye to begin opening. Be mindful now of this wide open eye as you go through your day. It is accessible at any time you desire. You need now only tune into this space and receive. Gradually, begin becoming aware of your breath again. Breathe in and breathe out. Bring your attention to your body and gently begin wiggling your toes and your hands. Breathe in and breathe out. Notice sounds around you. Breathe in and breathe out. When you're ready, open your eyes. Very powerful. And I have to say the, the biggest thing for me was it felt like it was a minute. Very powerful. Really, really wonderful. And I want to thank you, Michelle. Um, and no pun intended, but it has been a third eye opening delight speaking with you today. I am so grateful to you for that gift, that meditation. I don't know where I just went, but it was nice. Um, you know, and thank you for sharing your journey with us and for reminding us that we can trust our intuitive voices and for making the connections that the practice of psychic energy will place us in a greater state of balance and that our overall physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being will improve in doing so. And um, I have to say, I don't think I'm ever going to walk through a grocery store or a market and see it the same way ever again. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kristen. A, a truly an honor and pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Intuitive Hour with Michelle Beltran. If you like what you heard, please share our podcast with a friend and be sure to visit michellebeltran.com to get Michelle's popular Develop Your Clairvoyance ebook. <laughs>